and welcome to At Issue. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. A lot has changed in Washington, D.C., not just the president. There were a lot of changes that we're going to discuss with the uh, recently elected for her third term, representative from the 17th Congressional District, Sherry Bustos. Thank you for joining us again on At Issue. Thank you, H. Uh, just for the viewers, uh, the 17th is Tazewell County, southern portion of Peoria, up to Moline and then northwest and picks off a portion of Rockford. 14 counties, 7,000 square miles, all of central and northwestern Illinois. And you've been touring uh, the, that as you visit here this long weekend before the inauguration. And just for, for reference purposes, this, tape, this was taped before the inauguration. Some of you watching this will be watching after the inauguration. So references like president-elect, he may be president by the time you watch okay. this. So right. uh, with that, uh, your assessment of the election. You had predicted double-digit gains for the Democrats in the House. You predicted the Senate would go Democratic. Ooh, do, do you have a sense of what happened and what's next? Yeah, so, you know, the reality is we picked up uh, six seats uh, as Democrats in the U.S. House of Representatives. We did not gain back leadership in the Senate, although in Illinois we have a new Democratic senator, uh, Tammy Duckworth, and I'm very pleased with that. I think she's going to be an outstanding senator. Um, yeah, you know, Donald Trump um, had a message that resonated, especially in the rural areas, in the blue-collar areas. Uh, you know, the exit polling and the political scientists who are studying this are, are saying that um, he resonated with people that at one point had been, um, you know, leaning more toward uh, Democrats. Um, in our congressional district, he won the 17th congressional district, uh, yet I won by 20 points. And I, you know, for those who are listening who live in the 17th congressional district and um, were nice enough to support me, I, I'm very grateful for that. Um, so I've received a lot of questions about, well, how do you win by 20 points and yet Donald Trump also in your congressional district. And, um, you know, I get down to maybe a, a couple thoughts on it. And, th and that is, you know, when I'm not out in Washington, D.C., I am back in Illinois. I mean, this is my home. Um, I report to the people of the, the 711,000 people of this congressional district. Um, I talk to them. I listen to them. And when I go back out to Washington, my job is to make sure that um, as we've had dialogues about where the federal government gets in their way uh, is an impediment to their success, that I either write legislation or get on legislation that's helpful to them. Um, you know, we were talking about what I did before coming here to Peoria. I was in Canton right before coming here today, and I do something called Supermarket Saturday. And all that is is um, I spend an hour or so at a, at a grocery store in Canton or Sterling or Moline or, um, or Pekin, walk the aisles and as as moms are picking out their cornflakes for their kids or dads are picking out tangerines i'm just asking them you know what's on your mind what do you want me to know when i head back out to washington and and listening to people and and, and showing up and caring so there there what but there wasn't a sense when you were because you, you've been coming back to the district your past two terms mm -hmm. as, as congresswoman mm -hmm. you didn't get the sense before the election that things were going uh, contrary to what you had hoped? Well, you know, I, I campaigned all over the country for, um, for candidates running for Congress. And um, we had some outstanding candidates who stand for issues that are important to, to families, to seniors, to working men and women, you know, for making sure that Medicare is there, not just for the generation now, but for the next generation and our children's generation and to make sure that Social Security, you know, the greatest lifter out of poverty in the history of our country is there and is, in, and is strong. That's what we as Democrats stand for. And, um, you know, that, that working men and women that they, you know, that we're fighting for, for their pay and their benefits and, and all that. So it's not like what we stand for as Democrats is wrong. I think we're in sync with, with people in our region and the American public. Uh, Donald Trump had a message that resonated, make America great again. I'm going to bring your jobs home. Um, and in an area like ours, where we've seen Maytag ship every last one of its jobs over to Mexico, or in my first campaign, the company called Sensata that Bain Capital bought out and sent every last one of those jobs over to China. 
um, or company Robert Shaw in Hanover, Illinois, which is in the northwest part of our state, sending every last one of those jobs over to Mexico despite having a zero, um, close to a zero defect rate in the valves that they produced. Um, so, you know, people who don't make the same wage that they did a dozen years ago, who lost their jobs to Mexico or China or someplace else, um, his message resonated. And, and frankly, um, you know, our overall message, it, people didn't feel like uh, we, were, we were going to deliver. Well, you've brought up the question of jobs, and you have introduced as your first piece of legislation in the 115th Congress is the, outsource, the Overseas Outsourcing Accountability Act. Mm -hmm. Explain what that is and how that's going to help your district. Well, in, in, it, it really uh, is calling on the Trump administration to uh, not just um, have Donald Trump tweet in the middle of the night that he's going to bring jobs home or, uh, you know, say something bad about I'm not going to eat Oreo cookies anymore uh, because they're, you know, have shipped jobs overseas or, you know, whatever his next tweet's going to be. But to say, you know, doing this 140 characters at a time is not a policy. So my legislation, and I've, I have a lot of uh, co-sponsors of this, mostly from the industrial heartland, that are saying uh, we, we would ask, respectfully ask that you produce a plan, um, and then we would have a measurement tool in there that every two years it would look at this outsourcing prevention plan um, to make sure that it's actually doing what um, it needs to do. Um, as, as Democrats, we have a package of 80 pieces of legislation. And it's under the umbrella that we call Make It in America. And what Make It in America, all that means is that we want to make products here and then sell those overseas instead of having companies make things overseas. Um, and But we have 80 bills that are part of that that help address making sure there is no tax incentive for a company like Sensata, the one out of Freeport, Illinois, that, that made automotive sensors and then sent the jobs over to China. Um, there, there were actually incentives, tax incentives, for that company to send those jobs to China. Well, you know, number one, nobody should benefit by sending jobs overseas. Um, and then number two, how do we make sure that people are trained for the next industrial revolution? How do we make sure that um, we can search for um, places where small and mid-sized companies can export their goods? Um, you know, if you're a small or mid-sized company and don't have um, the same uh, availability as a company like Caterpillar or Deer has of lawyers sitting around the table and, and export um, experts who can identify different markets. We, we want to help small and mid-sized companies find those audiences as well. Talking about those kinds of jobs that, that uh, you've just mentioned, the last report I saw, approximately four out of five manufacturing jobs have been lost to robotics. Mm -hmm and efficiencies, not to those jobs going overseas. Now, there's still 20% going overseas. Right. So does your bill address that at all, or is it just let's keep the jobs that we can keep here and maybe incorporate training so that employees are up to speed on the new advanced technology, the robotics? Well, among our, the 80 bills in our Make It in America package, we do, we do address that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of it is retraining um, for what the next, as I said, the next industrial revolution. You know, the factory floor of yesterday is very different from the factory floor of today, and it will be very different uh, from the factory floor of, of uh, tomorrow. You know, my father-in-law worked at John Deere, and um, he built help build combines and um, you know and, and he made a wage that could support um, his four kids and his wife and um, he had an eighth grade education and um, you know those jobs are hard to come by now so what we're saying is um, part of our package of legislation also addresses uh, training in high school so if kids want to go into the trades of various sorts um, that they are ready for those um, we have some great examples in our community college um, community colleges from throughout our region, uh, training people for what the next generation looks like. But part of it is training. Part of it is we have to come to grips as a nation as to what this uh, mechanization will mean, what the automation will mean. You know, we're talking about self-driving cars now that are not. You know, that's not going to be. Um, that will be in our lifetime. You know, this is happening right now, and that becoming widespread, 
uh, that's going to happen. And how are we going to be ready for it? I don't have all the answers, um, but I certainly have questions about what we can do to be ready for it. And, and we are going to have to come to grips with that as a nation. Let's turn to committee assignments. Uh, you have been and you have been reassigned again to both agriculture and to the infrastructure and transportation committees. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about transportation first. The Highway Trust Fund is funded about 90% by the federal tax on diesel fuel and gasoline. Those tax rates, 18.3 and 24.3 cents, haven't been raised since 1993. The, the Highway Trust Fund is shrinking and we have an infrastructure problem in America. Do you have a, a suggestion as to where this nation needs to go with regard to that? I have a, a proposed fix that will last about six years. Um, but there's a mechanism in there that will study what we need to do from, from a long-term perspective. And, the, and the, the piece of legislation that I support and has bipartisan support, and I think that's very critical as we, as we move forward, we, we can't do things strictly along a party basis. It can't be all Republican and all Democrat if we're really going to move our country forward. So the bill that I um, am, am a proponent of, it's a, it repatriates the overseas profits um, that corporations have um, outside of the United States. Um, and what repatriation means is these $2 trillion in corporate profits that are sitting overseas with companies having no incentive to bring those back, um, the repatriation of that means bringing those profits back to the United States, taxing those at a level that uh, corporations would be willing to bring those home, and then investing those in our infrastructure. Um, it has wide bipartisan support that buys us about six years worth of robust funding for our infrastructure. Um, and then as part of that same bill, it all also calls for a study of what do we need to do on a long-term basis. Um, we have uh, cars and trucks that get better gas mileage than we've ever had. Uh, you know, President Obama had this mandate that a fleet of cars have to make on average 45 miles a gallon. Um, so, you know, the, the miles we're getting per gallon, it's, you know, it's improving every single year. Um, on top of that, we have electric vehicles um, that don't buy um, any gas. And um, so this, no matter what the gas tax rate is, it's not going to be, that's not going to be the answer. We're gonna to have to look at something um, other than just raising a gas tax. I know uh, Secretary LaHood, who's, who's from the Peoria area, is an advocate for increasing the gas tax. What I'm saying is let's do this repatriation. It doesn't harm, uh, especially lower income people who are having a hard time making ends meet anyway. Um, it, it gives corporations an incentive to bring it back, and it gives us funding to help improve our infrastructure. We need to talk about farming because a good portion of your district is agricultural in nature. The, the farm bill is due up again in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, debate on that should start somewhere this coming spring, maybe summer. And uh, things like uh, the, um, this, the uh, safety uh, net issues, mm -hmm. uh, crop insurance, mm -hmm. things of that nature are on the table. What do you support? Well, I was involved with writing and passing the last five-year farm bill. Um, I'm very proud to have been on the Ag Committee and being part of that. You know, that we came together, it, again, in, in bipartisan support of this. It, it passed out of the, our committee. Um, in bipartisan fashion, it passed on the House floor after you know, some vigorous debate. Um, but probably among the biggest changes in that is before this last farm bill, we had what was called direct payments. You probably remember that. Um, even farmers were saying, okay, we're not going to be able to keep doing that. And certainly taxpayers were saying, that's not, that's not a very good use of our taxpayer dollars to have these direct payments to uh, farmers, some of whom were doing, many of whom were doing very well at the time. So we converted that to a, a, a robust crop insurance program. Um, and that, would, that was the number one ask that I had from our family farmers all over our congressional district. Um, and what's great about that is it's working. And um, we certainly want to make sure, and I don't, I don't care if, you know, if people are watching this and they're not farmers and they're wondering, well, why, why would we as taxpayers want to support crop insurance for, for our family farmers? It's because they feed the world. And we, we want our family farmers to succeed. Um, we don't want uh, someone who's at the mercy of Mother Nature, no matter what the season is. 
um, and not being able to predict if, you know, the Illinois River is going to be flooding, if the Mississippi River is going to flood, if we're going to have a drought, if we're going to, you know, have, uh, you know, this deep freeze, whatever it may be. We've got to make sure that family farmers are in a position to be successful. And so the crop insurance program, I think, has worked out very well. Um, what I would see going forth in the next farm bill is to, to make sure that we don't lose ground on that. There are some urban lawmakers who don't understand it. And the reason the, uh, the nutrition program, the SNAP, SNAP program, is part of the farm bill is so urban lawmakers can be supportive of the overall farm bill. Um, so they can get on board with supporting the nutrition program at the same time they can get on board with a, cro a robust crop insurance program. And I think it's very important that we don't decouple that. Um, otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to get the support of urban lawmakers. And we talk about Farm Bill, and you, you mentioned SNAP, and we probably should point out to the audience that's, that the, the actual agriculture, the farmer portion of the Farm Bill is a smaller than SNAP. That is and correct. Et cetera. Yeah. So. You know your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Just did a little bit of homework. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about political structure. You've mentioned both in transportation and in ag, bipartisan, mm -hmm. bipartisan. That sounds all wonderful and good, but in, there's a sense that there's not bipartisanship. You have recently, in this new Congress, been appointed to a leadership position. First of all, con congratulations Thank on you. that. You uh, are the co-chair of the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee. But as I looked at all the leadership positions in the Democratic Party, you're the only one from the Midwest. And we tend to say, Bipartisanship starts in the Midwest and moves outward, but all of these people, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, California, that's where the leaders come from. What's your role in this new position and how might you bring this sense of bipartisanship, if, if that's possible, with Republicans, etc.? Well, it, I mean, it's uh, really a great honor to be able to sit at that leadership table now. Um, and it also comes with what I see as a great responsibility um, in that I am the only Midwestern voice, on, the only voice from the heartland sitting around the leadership table. And um, I, I think even the fact that I was um, selected and then elected among my colleagues to sit there is a recognition that um, Democrats have not done so well in the industrial heartland. Um, and again, back to the, the conversation we were having earlier, Donald Trump won my district, so he's obviously resonating, and yet I won by 20 points. So what causes um, a voter to go in that ballot box or you know, have their, their ballot in front of them and say, Donald Trump, and then I'm, then I'm gonna go over to Sherry Bustos. I mean, our politics are <laughs> pretty different. Um, but I, my role is to make sure that the voice of the Midwest and the voice of the heartland is heard at the leadership table. So we don't neglect the fact that, you know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of blue collar workers. Um, you know, think about, again, Caterpillar, John Deere. We have major industrial uh, or uh, aerospace manufacturing up in, in the Rockford area. And in between all that, it's rural. So of my 14 counties, 11 of the 14 are, are rural. So ag is still our number one economic driver. Um, you know, so what I'll talk about is, um, you know, these supermarket Saturdays that I do and, and listen to people. And I'll talk about, we do something called Sherry on Shift, where I job shadow people. And when I'm job shadowing the welder or the, the carp processor or the forklift driver um, or the beekeeper, you know, I'm not just seeing what they do, but we're having a conversation about, you know, what do you do to support your family? And how are things going? And, and then not just listening, but then going back out to Washington and either writing or supporting legislation that reflects what needs to happen in, in our communities. So can you explain to us how you do change a filter on a locomotive? <laughs> yeah, that's what I got to do today. So I was at BNSF Rail Yard in Galesburg, and my sherry on shift was uh, to change an air filter on a locomotive engine. Um, and I always ask for a grade from who's ever teaching me. Uh -oh. uh, you know, give me an A, B, C, D, or F. And my staff usually thinks I probably deserve a D. <laughs> but I, the lowest grade I've gotten so far is a C plus because I, I think I get a little credit for at least trying. Um, but these, <laughs> these air filters on a, a locomotive um, engine are this big. And, and again, you have no idea about what people do for a living unless you see this up close and personal. And, you know, as a, as a former, you know, almost two-decade uh, journalist, you know, where you, you are in a great position as you are right now to be able to ask questions and get to know people. 
Um, I use what I did for a living for, for a long time, and that's just transitioned to what I do as a member of Congress to learn what people do. Let's stay at Galesburg. You were changing filters mm -hmm. uh, in Galesburg, but let's talk about water because that became a big issue here recently. Yeah. And what are you doing, what can you do at the federal level to assure that there's not only safe water for communities, but safe water for students in your district? Yeah, I um, have legislation that we've introduced that would um, take a look at making sure at schools, um, daycares, places where kids are, um, that we know whether the water that is going into those water fountains, you know, kids are outside playing kickball and 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 tag and running around and they come back in and they're all thirsty and they're you know lapping up the water as fast as they can well as as parents you know we want to make darn sure that there's no lead in that water because anybody in public health or um or, or anybody who has studied this issue knows that water and lead in children should never mix so we have legislation that addresses that and i actually want to um you know say you know good job to the illinois state legislature that just passed legislation that, um, that looks at testing water in our schools. Um, that's really good. We need to do that nationally. I mean, I don't care what state you live in, lead and water and children should not mix. You've been talking a lot about what you learn and what you can do to help families in your district. So let's continue that conversation uh, with things that, what, what, what have you learned and what can you do to help with achieving paid family leave and with uh, affordable child care, things of that nature. Um, here's something encouraging, and uh, you're, you're breaking this story because I don't think any of us have talked about this, this publicly, but um, we have a group of, uh, we have a women's caucus, um, and it's bipartisan. Um, and I happen to be friends with a lot of the Republican women because we play on the Congressional Women's Softball team together. And, uh, but we are getting together to um, come up with a women's agenda. And um, actually one of our, uh, one of my colleagues who I'm very close with um, called Donald Trump after the election and uh, said, you know, we wanna work on this women's issue. And he said, well, hold on a second, let me put Ivanka on. And so uh, one of my colleagues has had a, a conversation with her she, she will be our point person in the White House because this is her passion. She's a mother of young kids and has said that this is her, this is what she wants to work on as the, the daughter of the next president. So we are coming up with um, a package of legislation that will uh, look at issues that will be important to women. And, and I think what's important to note though is people who are watching this who maybe are not women, these are family issues. Um, and you know I'm the mother of three sons and, and two grandkids, and um, and but my husband is the father of three sons and and two grandkids. So um, the, you know these are family issues that we want what's best for our families. We want families to have um, access to you know family leave if they need to take um, uh, leave for some reason. That if somebody has a sick child, that they have an opportunity to stay home with that sick child or take that sick child to the to the doctor. Um, and you look at so many jobs where people are not in the position, they either have to go to work because they will not get paid, uh, they don't have any time to take off, uh, so they, they go to work sick or they leave a sick child at home who's way too young to be at home by himself or herself. And so we wanna help address that and make sure that families have an opportunity to succeed. A final thought in the minute we have remaining. You, of course, are very supportive of getting more women into Congress, and you, you took a step back. You had 84 in the House, now you have 83. Some of the women you supported, in fact, a good number of them did not win, mm -hmm. Yoder and people like that. Uh, Stephanie Murphy did, uh, down in Florida. Uh, disappointing that the progress that you had hoped for did not occur with getting female in, leadership, in, uh, in positions of government? Yeah, but for, for the reason that um, women do govern differently. I mean, I've, I've been on a city council, I've been, been in Congress now. Um, we're, you know, relationships and collaboration and finding a common place to start a dialogue, is, those are all, I mean, among the women colleagues I have, both Republicans and Democrats, that's, those are common denominators. We don't see everything as winning and losing. Um, you know, I look at what's going on in Springfield with Governor Rauner um, being unwilling to sit down and even start a dialogue. Uh, he's entering le year three of his governorship, and yet we don't have a budget. 
Um, I think it's unconscionable what that does to families. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, it's not hard for women to put our ego to si aside and to find a starting place. And, you know, I, I would encourage uh, Governor Rauner to put his ego aside and, and, and have his North Star be the people of the state of Illinois and, and do what's right. You've turned our attention to the state. And uh, we'll, before we tell you about next week's program, let me say thank you. Congratulations on your reelection. Thank you. Thank you so much to Congresswoman Sherry Bustos of the 17th Congressional okay. District for joining us on that issue. Thanks, Age. And we turn our attention to Republicans next week on that issue. And to state issues, we have two central Illinoisans who are retiring from the State House, David Leach of Peoria, Don Moffat of Galesburg. They'll be with us next time to look back and look forward the next time you see, you, you see us on At Issue. <laughs>